Well, hey, everybody. Well, uh, thanks for being here today. I'm in not even business casual, but I am representing the Republic and uh, glad you're with us in a summer episode of our leadership podcast. I'm super excited to have Sam Yoon on the uh, podcast with us. Sam, I didn't even ask you, is that the right way to say your last name? That, that's perfect. Perfect. So I'm, I'm a little, it's kind of a sore spot for me, you know, like <laughs> pronouncing names. So uh, you did great. You did fantastic. Okay. Yeah, no, Sam is has been with uh, Saddleback Church for quite a while. I want him to tell his story, but super excited. This is, this is a little bit of a niche. I think it's applicable to more than just campus pastors, but Sam's written a book about uh, his first year as a campus pastor in one of the best churches in the world, really, not even America. Yeah. And uh, excited to dive into that, but also some leadership uh, principles that are transferable really for anybody starting a new anything. Yeah. So Sam, welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you for having me, William. So glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. Let, let us know your story. I mean, I, I I love introducing my friends to other friends. It's kind of yeah. Better, so yeah. So I I I've been doing ministry for about seventeen years. I know I look like I could be still in college, but um, much older than that. But uh, been around. I started at a Korean church, worked at Mariners for a couple of years, and then I've been at Saddleback for about almost seven years. And at Saddleback, I started out as an associate pastor, kind of like the the number two guy. And then the past, uh, five and a half years, I've been, I was a campus pastor for the, one of the campuses here at our, at one of our locations. And I've actually just shifted over to a new role, the leadership development pastor for our church. So how to develop leaders and overseeing our leadership program at our church. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I've written a few books. I'm actually writing one right now as part of my summer project. And, uh, Every time I do this, I'm like, you've either got to be crazy. Everybody thinks it's cool to write a book, but you either got to be crazy or have something inside you that's got to get out. Yeah. So what was the something inside you? First of all, give us the elevator pitch of the book itself. And then the why, but why take all the time to write that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So I, I was a campus pastor five and a half years. I loved it. Got, got some training and, and learned a lot. And I had a really difficult first year as a campus pastor um, and so out of that pain, uh, I learned a lot. I failed a lot, made a lot of mistakes. And I realized as I've, as I've now been doing it for so long and talking to other campus pastors, it's just, there's not a lot of resources out there. There's some, there's not a lot of books. There's some articles. There's some things that people have talked about like leadership network and different things, but there's just not a ton of stuff out for campus pastors, which is kind of a niche market, but there's about 5,000 campus pastors. I think there's some studies that were done about that. And so uh, and it's growing. Multi-site strategy is one of the fastest ways to grow your church, at least before COVID. Um, and so I thought, you know what? Like I've learned a lot. I've I've been able to grow from this awesome church and have a lot of leaders speak into me and help me develop my own philosophy and ideas of leadership. And so I wanted to write this book to help um, create a healthy team and healthy culture for the campuses. And I think what you said is is absolutely right. Like this isn't just for campus pastors. I think it's transferable to any pastors because it's it's just a strategy of how to think through your first year to start off well because i think how you start off really uh it doesn't determine how you're going to finish but it's a really good indicator of where you're going to be um and how oh, yeah. you're going to finish yeah totally agree a great book for anybody that's starting a new anything is your first 90 days yes fantastic read yes. absolutely i mean nearly every job i've had in my career i sit down at the desk the day after i got hired and i'm like mm, now what do i do yeah. And uh, it's a lot of figuring it out. And I, I, I don't know about you, Sam, but like so many things. And, and if you pastored through the pandemic, you did this more than I did. But when I was pastoring, it's like I would sit and work on whatever it needed to be worked on. I'm like, and where are the class notes from seminary where we studied? Because it's yeah. it's yeah. all new. And on the other hand, nothing's new. I remind my uh, my Catholic friends and clients, you guys are the first multi-site church. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Yeah thousands of years. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So let me, let me start here. You said that your first year was really hard mm -hmm. and I don't know, I'm prying, but yeah. Tell us about, tell us about the struggle. What was it? Where'd you fail? I mean, what, what made you go? Oh, and, and then of course, how'd you get out of it? Yeah. So I, I didn't start the campus when I first got there, it was uh, six months. A, new, a guy started it, launched it. And then they, um, he actually stepped out um, cause he got called somewhere else. And while that happened, we got moved, we got kicked out of the high school we were meeting at, and we had to go to a different location. And so for nine months, they had no campus pastor, there was no leader there. Um, and no one really, it was, they're having a hard time finding a position to fill that. So 
I finally got in, involved into that role and asked to do it. And, and during that time, um, it was, it was nine months. Imagine nine months without having a leader. That's, that's just tough. Right. And, and, and on top of that, the campus, we had to move nine times out of the year. We weren't in one location. We're a set up tear down church and we had to move nine times. So that's like 20% of the, of the year, like one in every five, six weeks, we would be in a different location. Um, and so one of my first things when I got there was, Hey, uh, we have to go, where are we going to meet for in church in a month? because we don't have a location where we're going to do it. And so I was stressed out about that. We only had one staff member there that was overseeing our campus at the moment. And she was doing a lot, a million different things. Uh, a lot of volunteers were, um, you know, they were kind of, some of them were burning out and, and just overwhelmed and not a lot of vision and direction. We moved around and um, there's just a lot of questions of like, would our campus survive? Would we be able to handle all these challenges that we were presented? especially with the move, like it's hard enough just to do one location. So every location we, we would literally be, we've been around like nine different locations around the city uh, in this area, like hotels. We had our Christmas services on the Queen Mary in Long Beach on a boat. Like it was super cool, but a, a huge logistical nightmare just to get sure. like every place is different. Like tech, the, our tech director was stressed out all the time. Our worship, like it's just a, a massive logistical challenge to move to just one location. Um, and so we would it, bring it'll in these wear people out. It'll wear huh? people out. Sorry. It'll wear you out. Sorry no, to interrupt, no. but like the only time retirement's mentioned in the Bible is, is the priests. I don't know if you know this, but like in, when they're wandering through the desert yeah. in, I forget where in the Pentateuch it is, but there's a, a rule that says that at this age, the priests need to step down. And it's like, well, is that because they're no longer relevant? And it's like, no, uh, they were in arguably the worst set up tear down situation yes. in the history of the world. Yes. They had candlesticks and tapestries and all the ornaments and everything. And, you know, those guys set up the, the tabernacle and then they look up and it's like, oh, man, the cloud just moved. Mm -hmm. Break it down, set it back. And it led it led Moses to say, OK, you guys, sooner or later, this is going to wear you out. I mean, that, yeah. that whole load in load, it's still true today. Oh, absolutely. And we felt that that was, that's kind of the running joke for the South Bay. Our campus was like, we are like Israelites in the wilderness, just moving around. And so did that for the first year. And, and when you asked the, what mistakes I made, I made mistakes of like hiring and firing and, and bringing on the right, wrong people. And just a lot of uh, communication issues and just a lot of challenges that came but even in the midst of all that, like every year we actually grew. Um, our attendance was actually more people were still coming. When we went to different locations, we actually picked up more people and they were some sort of energy where God was doing something amazing in our, in our campus. And so even in the midst of that, it was, there were some cool things that were happening. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So in the, in the book, uh, you walk through things. Let me, let me see if I put you on the spot. Yeah. Tell me a principle that you learned for first year at campus pastor that anybody listening could could take into whatever their next assignment is. Yeah, I think uh, well, you mentioned it before about the 90 day plan, like uh, the, the your 90 day plan. I, I read that book. That was influential for me. So one of the things I did that I think is applicable to anyone is before you actually start your role, um, um, talk to a lot of different people, but create a 90 day plan of what you're going to do to start your, to your, your job or your new role in and, and really make it methodical, intentional, like who are you going to talk to, who are you going to meet? Um, and not necessarily you have to do a lot of stuff, especially if you're starting a new role. I would highly recommend build relationships with people, find the key influencers, find the people that are in the organization or volunteers or leaders or staff members that you need to talk to and, and make it a, a point to plan it all out. Um, and so in the book, I talk about how the 90 day plan should be relationally based, especially the first couple months. And then also kind of assessing the health of a campus, assessing the health of your ministry. Um, so you're kind of doing those two things together, building relationships, hearing what's going on, how things are going with and connecting with people, all different types of people. And the second thing is um, just assessing how, how healthy is our ministry? How healthy is our, um, as our, as our church or campus and really being able to dive deeper, but making that plan before you actually start, so that when you actually start, you are you aren't just like wondering what should I do. You are you already have a plan, and you can always change those plans and adjust it. But um, the more intentional you are, I think the better outcome you're going to have, and more um, more more abilities to pivot or change rather than trying to make it up on the fly. That's good. That's good. I thought we made everything up on the fly. I've been doing it for the whole of my life. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Hey, so let me ask you this. There are probably people, um, we could do this from either side. There are probably pastors at multi-site churches listening. Yeah. There are probably also people who are saying, uh, I'm thinking about becoming a campus pastor. It's a job right out of seminary for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, what should what should a candidate who's thinking about becoming a campus pastor, what should they ask themselves about the job they're looking at to see if it fits? Does that make sense? No, absolutely. So in the book, I actually talk about that. The first two chapters, like before you become a campus pastor, like what is that process to consider or think through? And, and there's four things I, I mentioned is first, check your heart. Like, why do you want to be a campus pastor? Like, if I was honest, I wanted to be a campus pastor. Um, obviously, we are all going to say the same thing. I want to do it for God's, God's kingdom. I want to have more influence. I want to lead more. And, and those are absolutely true and honest. Um, but the, the deeper motivation behind it is also something that you need to t- check your heart. Because there's another part of me that was, I wanted it for the status. I wanted to be, um, I wanted a sense of, of pride, a sense of ownership, a sense of like, I'm, it, 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 it was almost the sense of like, it's about me, even though I knew it's not. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, why do you want that um, promotion if, if for some places, right? Or why do you want that role in that position? And Patrick Lencioni talks about the motivations where people are motivated by more by these ex- external uh, things, maybe a bigger paycheck or status and a sense of, 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 of significance in the organization. And, and that's okay to a certain point, but I think you have to really know what, what is going on, the motivation behind it. And so I wanted to be a campus pastor for so long, but I had the wrong heart and God didn't give me that position until a year later where my heart was actually in a much better place and more in a, in, in a more character filled place where a more humble place. So the first thing I would say is check your heart. Why do you want to do this? And, and really be honest with yourselves. So there's some questions I outlay, uh, outline in the book. The second one is obviously check with God. What does God want you to do? Um, whatever God wants you to do, you just got to do it. But being able to hear his voice and know what his voice sounds like um, is really important because you got to distinguish your voice versus God's voice. And sometimes we merge those two together. And, um, and it's important to distinguish that because God's word is very clear. And, and sometimes it, it may not be clear, like audibly, like God's going to say, hey, go do this job. But there's if you are able to hear the shepherd, he will speak to you and lead you and guide you, especially in a big moment like this. The other one I say is check with your family. Because as a campus pastor, um, as we all know, um, pastoring is not just going to be about me. Your whole family's in this too. And so your wife, your kids are going to be impacted by this. So having the conversation with your family and me and my wife, we, when we were asked to, for this opportunity, we had 48 hours to decide. And so we prayed and fasted for those 48 hours. And we were like, man, God, if you're going to want us to do this, give us some Bible verses and make it very clear that you're leading us to this. The first night my wife and I, we came and we're like, no, nah, we got nothing. The second night we came back, we're like, oh, we got some verses. And she had some verses. I had some verses. And we're like, you know, we really feel like this is where God is leading us to. And so checking with your family, check with your kids, making sure that they're part of the process, that they understand that um, this is not that you're asking them to do it, but you're, you're part of a team to do it together. And the last one is just check with the church. Like um, some churches, there's different types of models of multi-siding out there. And so you got to really know, like, is this fit me? If I'm a teacher and preacher, maybe this video venue is not going to be for me. And, and right. that automatically discounts you. But if you're like, man, I, I want to teach, then you got to go check out a different church. And, 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 and so knowing the position that's out there, but also the values in the culture, right? And so I, I encourage people to interview the church, uh, uh, former staff members, interview current staff members, interview former campus pastors or people that are doing your role and get as much information as possible. So you're not walking in with this pie in the sky thinking, oh yeah, the church is great. I heard great things about it. Everybody loves it. That may be true, but sometimes a member has a very different experience from a staff member and really understanding the culture of the church before you get into it will help you distinguish, man, is that role right for me? And is the church culture right for me and my family? Because some churches, they demand a little bit more from their wives or your kids and their work hours are very different. And you don't want to go in naively thinking, oh yeah, it's going to be this great experience. Uh, where in, in fact, every church is a little bit different. It's, it, there's a different culture. As you know, you wrote a book on culture wins. I love that book, by the way, mm-hmm. I quote it in the book. Um, but yeah, I, you just have to know what the culture is because you will, it's more than just uh, your job that you're thinking at. Well, I, I, I tell candidates and clients, whether it's a church or school or nonprofit or whatever, uh, you know, the whole a hiring process or an interviewing process, if you're interviewing, if it's done well, uh, nobody walks down the aisle with Rachel and wakes up next to Leah. (laughs) So like, 
So, and that means to get that done, you got to ask the hard questions. You got to find honorable ways to do it, right? Like for instance, help me with this because I don't know the answer to this. When I sit down to start a search, and we'll use the church, and we do think a lot of things besides the churches, but let's use the church as an example. I'll sit down with the hiring agent, right? Yeah. The, the Steve Johnson or, or yeah. whoever it is um, at Saddleback. And I'll say, listen, let me ask you this. We're looking for a campus pastor. These roles, they're very few campus pastor for life people. Yeah. It's a developmental role. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's not a bad thing. So Steve, or, or if it's you, if it's Sam, the, the leadership development guy, how l- much time has to pass for me to be back here doing this search again, and you're not in a bad mood. Yeah. So it's a nice way of saying like, what's, what's an acceptable tenure for this? Is it mm-hmm. three years, five years, seven years? So if you're a candidate, you're the leadership development guy, you're going to have to interview people. Yeah. How should a candidate ask that kind of question without sounding like they're, they're gunning for the next job? Does that make right. sense? No, absolutely. And I think part of it is also knowing what is your shape? How are you, uh, what's your skill sets, your passions, your experience? And then what does this role really entail? Um, and you, you can obviously ask the interviewer, but also ask former campus pastors are like, man, like, some see campus pastors are not teachers. They're not ever going to teach and they don't never want to teach. I know some of our campus pastors are like that. And that's a great thing that they're just gifted to, um, to manage, to pastor, to, to lead in that way versus, and this role, if that fits your role, like, I think you can, you can be in there in a long time. And I think asking those questions, like what, what, what is this skill set and the, and the gifting that you want in this role? And what is, What's an accept? I think asking them, hey, like, tell me how how long campus pastors who have thrived in those roles, um, how long have they lasted, and and what is their satisfaction level with this role? And and I think that gives you a window insight to, yeah, we 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 want people here longer, but as long as it fits their shape, as long as it fits their passions, and they know what they're getting themselves into. Do. Um, I think you're right. Sometimes it is seen as a developmental thing, and so it's just more like, well, let's just see how you do and and go from there, rather than putting people in the right place. Um, in the right bus and and saying, no, this is, this is, we don't expect you to be here forever, but we know that this is something that you're called to, you're good at, and and we want to and honor you and reward you accordingly. That's beautiful. I love this. Uh, maybe, maybe you say, hey, think of the the three campus pastors you'd put in the Hall of Fame. How long were they in that role? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Super helpful. So um, as you're looking out in the future at, you know, multi-site Right. And this is a bit off topic with the yeah. book. But but what have you seen in the seven years you've been doing that that seem to be trends that are changing and, and may stick around for a while within multi-site? Yeah, I think uh well, COVID's obviously changed everything. And uh, a lot of people are thinking through everything. So even for us, um, how you do multi-site, uh, what that looks like. I'm no, I'm no genie or I don't know anything in the future yet, but um it sounds like I think multi-site is still going to be an effective strategy to reach people, especially if you have a, a good culture and a good uh, a brand as well as a, a good developmental program. Um, I, I do. I am hearing more and more churches, especially bigger churches, start to have a leadership development emphasis, whether it's a role, a position, or uh, more intentionality. And so I think that's something where, especially with Gen Z, they're wanting more of that hands-on uh, mentorship and guidance. Um, and there's a different generation and culture that relational piece that I think um, is missing. And so I think that's something that's gonna be a huge need and value as we look to the future generations. And, and I think that's gonna shift the culture of the church where um, we necessarily can't do everything we've done in the past uh, the way the same way. And I think that's something we're looking at and evaluating. How do we use technology, but also use um, technology as well as using the, the, the strategy that we have used and has been effective. What does that look like in the future? Uh, I think some of the core principles of just authenticity and, and just some things that I know, like Clay Scroggins have written a book about um, the seven aspiring things. And I totally agree with that. I think just it's going to have to be contextualized in your church as well as your city, because every city is a little bit different. Like in California, we're very different from Texas. And, and just understanding those differences is going to be important um, to, 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 to be well and succeed well in the multi-site world. That's excellent. This has been super helpful, Sam. I, I really appreciate you yeah. and what you're doing and and talking about the future. Here we are at a handoff at your church. Yeah. You yeah. got a new pastor coming in. And I imagine that means everybody's like 
how we do multi-site is everything's kind of okay. Let's yeah. see what the next chapter holds. So uh, yeah. yeah, appreciate you. Uh, you say you're not learning on the fly. I know you, I know you're intentional, but we're all learning on the fly. You just happen to be very good at it. And uh, appreciate you writing the book. Uh, title of the book is your first year as a campus pastor, practical it, guide to build a healthy team and culture. And it's on uh, Amazon and all the things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Great. thank you. Hey, Sam, your uh, website for your blog. It's Samuel Yoon, S-A-M-U-E-L-Y-O-O-N.com. Excellent. And if you are listening, then you're like, I'm driving, William, don't get me, make me write while I'm driving. Just go to vandernews.com. Your email address, it does not get, you're not going to get offers for Ginsu knives and salad shooters and all that. It's just the show notes and it'll have all those links, uh, including a recap of what we talked about today and, and a little bit of a, a peek into the future and who we're talking to next. Yeah. Sam, thanks for being with us today. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank Wish you. you yep. 